All right, now it's definitely nine. There's the one person who's going to change the world. She just walked in. All right, I'm going to get going now. So this session is sort of um, optimistically uh, entitled Organizing to Change the Climate or something like that. And this slideshow here uh, says we're going to talk about water management, which is really the key piece. So this is, um, I'm going to present some sciencey bits about a uh, different paradigm on the climate. Carbon dioxide is very much involved, but it isn't, in uh, my view now, the main story, nor the one that we need to pay the most attention to, which is water, in fact. And uh, if I confuse you, you might want to try going listening to Judith Schwartz this afternoon, because she's probably going to say many of the same kinds of things. But after we talk about the new paradigm, the water paradigm, and get to grasp it a bit, and look at some, we're going to look at a few examples of what sorts of work are the most uh, immediate in terms of shifting our focus and our resources. And then I'd like to do something like a discussion on how we take this into the community and how we spread these ideas around. So you all have things to say about that. My name is Peter Bain. I live in Western Michigan. I am a permaculture teacher and designer for the last 30 years. I work for the Permaculture Institute of North America as executive director part-time, helping to organize this very anarchic movement, uh, 40 years old, has done remarkable things. Most people don't know anything about it, or they've heard of it. Anyway, that's my job, my day job. Otherwise, I'm semi-retired, and I farm 10 acres. Uh, sandy soil, oak woods, uh, market vegetable crops. And uh, you know, what else? I guess they, maybe that's enough of an introduction about me. So this talks about carbon being transformed, and we all know the story about carbon. I think it's pretty well uh, heard here. There's a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It got there because human beings started disrupting soil and forests burning and um, solid carbon that was placed in the soil by plants and held there by microbes got released into the atmosphere and it's built up. We have some myths or some misunderstandings about that. Uh, one is that the carbon is the driver of the climate. That when you have more carbon in the atmosphere, it's, it gets warmer and when you have less, it gets cooler. They do sort of correlate. But actually, the, the larger story here, as I say, is water. Water is 95% mm, of the thermal dynamics of the atmosphere. It transfers the heat. It moves it from the surface to uh, the sky, and it moves it back down. Uh, it shades the planet in the form of clouds. Uh, transpired water coming off of vegetation is cooling the planet actively and always has. It's the main regulator. And also, there's kind of a, I don't know what to call it. I don't want to sound too conspiratorial, but there's a sort of dirty little secret about carbon dioxide, which is it's really easy to measure. We can measure it very accurately and precisely. So we know to the, you know, uh, tenth of, uh, or hundredth of a percent, you know, how much of it is in the atmosphere. And we have Charles Keeling built a laboratory on the top of Mauna Loa, which was the same mountain where I studied permaculture first in 1958 and began measuring uh, carbon dioxide because he's way out in the middle of the ocean and way high up and the atmosphere is even and smooth and not bothered by industrial in outputs. So we know, we know that this curve goes up and up and up. But uh, the importance and the political importance that got focused on carbon dioxide just stems out of the Carter years, the Carter administration in the 70s, when he really wanted to know what, was, what greenhouse uh, warming might, or get greenhouse gases and global warming might mean and how the government might address it. So he turned to the uh, Scripps Oceanographic Institute in San Diego and said, tell me this, you know, tell me what the story is. And they said, well, scratch their heads and said, well, let's give him something that he is reliable and so that we can measure. And they sent him statistics on carbon dioxide and how much it was increasing in the atmosphere. Well, that's all fine. It's one sort of measure, but it doesn't really tell us 
the whole big story. The whole big story in a nutshell is that we've disturbed the surface of the planet and it's overheating because we've let too much light in to strike the soil and turn from light to heat, from uh, shortwave to longwave radiation. That's what happens. You know, light, sunlight comes in, hits the rock, your, your sidewalk, the asphalt pavement in the parking lot, your cat's body, it's, it's laying out there in the sun. You know, it gets warm, re-radiates. Too much of that, the heat goes up. And then, then carbon dioxide along with lots of water vapor and CFCs and nitrous oxide and all these other minor gases, methane, hold it in like a blanket. That's the greenhouse effect. You learned this long ago in, in school. We all understand it. We wouldn't be here if we didn't have it. So it's vital and essential, but it's, uh, it's, we're just beginning to understand it. And the, the dynamics of the atmosphere are extremely complex. The reason the Scripps Institute didn't tell Carter anything about water vapor is because they couldn't model it in the 70s. They didn't have supercomputers in it big enough, and they hadn't begun to try to slice the problem up into small pieces to figure out how to track water and what it meant. Because there was too much of it. It was in multiple phases. It was all over the planet. It was in the oceans. It was in the ice caps. It was in the atmosphere. It was falling as rain. It was constantly on the move. And yet that's where the heat was being transferred and managed, regulated. So we now need to get responsible for water management if we're going to address the climate issues because the fundamental crisis in the climate it isn't the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. <clears throat> it's the amount of heating that's occurring from the land surface and the ocean surface, and the lack of evaporation or evapotranspiration, and the irregularity of the water cycling. In a healthy ecosystem, there's a lot of water moving up through transpiration and evaporation to make clouds, trees, nucleate, uh, bacteria, release them from their leaves. We'll go over all this again that uh, causes uh, snowflakes and raindrops to form in the clouds and fall out. And as they do that, they do some other important stuff, and that cools things. So the clouds re-radiate light back to space without it ever hitting the surface of the Earth to become heat. And the trees, as they photosynthesize and transpire, are transmitting huge amounts of energy without actually raising temperature. That's called latent heat. When you're, you know, when you feel the fire or the radiator, that's sensible heat. Your body can sense it. But when water changes phase from liquid to gas, a huge amount of energy is transferred. Same thing from ice to liquid. You know, every phase change of water is an enormous energy transformation. So when trees are transpiring, they're letting go a lot of energy without anything warming up. It's latent heat. It's a very important phrase. So let me see what. When it changes back to water, my understanding is it releases it. Yes, point, it releases it, but now it releases it way up there so it can re radiate out through the thinner atmosphere of the stratosphere and out to space harmlessly. It doesn't heat up the, the biosphere, essentially, the lower atmosphere, the oceans, the land surface. Thank you. Yeah, you, yes, in fact. Right. So carbon moves up and down between soil and sky. And this is normal. And you know, what we've done over the past approximately 7,000 years is move uh, you know, to 300 billion tons, 400 billion tons of carbon out of soil and into the atmosphere. We've burnt it off. We've oxidized it out of soils uh, by plowing, by burning trees. I think there's a, a general understanding or misunderstanding that uh, industrial civilization began changing the atmospheric uh, measurement of carbon about 1850, when the Industrial Revolution got going in this country and had been well advanced in Britain and started to happen in Germany and France and spread around the world. And that the number associated that with that, just like 350.org is trying to remind us we should drop the level 
of carbon in the atmosphere down from where it is in the 400s right now to a safer level. It was about 280 in 1850. But this was already accelerated or advanced or increased above the baseline. Uh, there's a climate scientist named William Ruddiman, who's, um, who's an oceanographer and worked, worked at the University of Virginia and has published a number of books. William F. Ruddiman, R-U-D-D-I-M-A-N. His books are very accessible. He wrote a lot of texts for college classes, uh, but there's a whole range of them. So beginning about 2003, a little later, he uh, began writing uh, based on new research that was coming from much more careful ice core studies in Antarctica. They were going down very deep, and they were getting back hundreds of thousands of years, even more than a million years. And the, the idea that we had had four glaciations, which is what I learned in school and which many of us were taught, and the was Illinoisan and the was Consonian and all this, that sort of thing, and the last one ended about 13,000 years ago, is not accurate. Those did occur, but there were many more before, maybe as many as 50 during this whole three, three million year period when glaciation has been pulsing, happening, on roughly a 100,000 year cycle. There are three uh, variables that shift, how wobbly the Earth is on its axis, how close or far away it is from the sun and its orbit, and they interact. And in general, with some variation, the glacial cycles run about 100,000 years and are interrupted by brief interglacial periods of around 10,000. That's the rough picture. It's not precise, but that's the average. So generally, we've been in the deep freeze for about 3 million years. And we've come out of it intermittently. And this last coming out of it is very significant in terms of, say, this conference. <laughs> the fact that we're even here and we're sitting on metal chairs, metal and plastic chairs, uh, and talking with each other about uh, agriculture. Because agriculture didn't exist in the last interglacial 100,000 years ago. We weren't ready as a species to step up and start planting and cultivating and then Great, growing surpluses and building cities. But we were ready 10,000 years ago, and it began to happen. That's one of the things we need to disabuse ourselves of, is our agriculture has existed only in this very brief period of stable, moderate climate in this interglacial period. And what's, what Rudiman's uh, reporting of the research that, that's important is that we have uh, now got a model of how glaciation sets in and how it ends, and how it sets in again and how it ends. And that's correlated with gaseous uh, levels in the atmosphere of carbon dioxide and methane. And this is all recorded in ice, frozen snow that's you know, piled up for miles deep in Antarctica. And we've studied it and carefully extracted very, very long cores and, and sliced them and looked at the segments and correlated that with time. And there's a curve. There's basically a, an onset of glaciation, and then there's a release of glaciation. And they're very similar. Why is that important? It's important because it gives us some perspective on where we are now. We know, for example, based on previous glaciations and a long run of them, that this one is anomalous. And it began becoming anomalous about 7,000 years ago. If we were following the normal uh, natural Earth pattern on glaciation of the last 3 million years, we, and had not interrupted it with human activities, we would be, or would have been by 1850, at about 240, not 280. Now, that doesn't sound real big, but it's actually very large. It means we would be headed well into another glacial cycle sometime in the next millennium. Not quite completely predictable. But in fact, by the intervention of early farmers who cut down and burnt forests in order to access soils, mostly in temperate regions, where humus had accumulated and soil was fertile, they didn't really have good metal tools 
no chainsaws and not really any axes to speak of or any worth anything 7,000 years ago. What they had was fire. So they burnt trees and they cleared ground. And we begin from that point. We can watch the curve. I've seen the you know, Rudiman's drawings or his graphs show that the, the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was gradually slowly sinking and had reached about 261. And then it starts to reverse and go up from about 7,000 years ago. If it had not been interrupted by this event of the invention of agriculture and the widespread adoption of cultivation, then it would have continued sinking over the next 7,000 years to the middle of the 19th century and reached 240. It didn't. It started going up. And then there's another slight uptick about 5,000 years ago, which seems to correlate very strongly with the expansion of paddy rice culture across East and South Asia. What happens in a rice paddy? Vegetation grows and rots in water. And what happens then? gives off methane, anaerobic digestion, so to speak, or decomposition of organic matter produces methane gas. And methane is a very strong greenhouse gas. There's a lot less of it in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide, but it has a, you know, it, it swings, a, you know, it bats above its weight uh, 15 or 20 times. It can when there's mercury being circulated by humans or from some very rare natural source, yes. The question was about methyl mercury, mercury and water, but I'm, I'm not you know, directly addressing that. I'm pointing out that methane comes into the picture about 5,000 years ago and also continues to accelerate the, uh, the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So that's the basic historic picture. Yeah. yeah, it does. Pollen counts have been very, very important in um, scientific assessments of what has happened with previous climate because it shows not only how much plant material there was, but what kinds of plants. So, for example, after the onset uh, or the um, warming of this interglacial period, we get into it about 1,000 years or so, and then there's a weird anomaly where the temperature suddenly plunges again back to glacial norms. And they call it the Little Dryas, D-R-Y-A-S. It lasts about 1,500 years. And the Dryas is some tiny little Arctic plant that grows high in the mountains in Europe. And suddenly it proliferates everywhere. And there's lots of Dryas pollen. So they call it the Little Dryas. It's thought that an enormous glacial lake in Ontario, what's now Ontario, burst through and flooded down the channel of what's the Ottawa River toward the St. Lawrence and out into the, um, the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the North Atlantic. And that huge, and I'm, I'm talking about the volume of a good part of the Great Lakes, a lot of fresh water, trillions and trillions and tens of trillions of gall gallons all at once, floods into the North Atlantic, yeah, and then it drops the salinity of the ocean there and interrupts the thermohaline circulation, hot, salty thermohaline, and that's what moves heat from the equator to the poles and helps balance out the planet's thermal budget. It's because fresh water is colder, salt water floats, or vice versa, and there's a circulation between the equator. It sinks, I think, salt water sinks up in the north, and it goes down to the equator, and it rises and comes back on the surface. So we get the Gulf Stream moving warm water north, which keeps Nor the coast of Norway ice-free all the way up to northern Russia, which would not normally be the case in that latitude. This was interrupted. And so those northern latitude areas got cold again and refroze, and snow started piling up on the Canadian Shield, and the glaciers started you know, readvancing for 1,500 years, and then for reasons no one quite understands, it ended like that. It just stopped. Anyway, that was a digression, but about pollen counts and how we know something about previous climate. 
So we have a picture in which human beings are uh, advancing the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, in particular carbon and methane, because of our agricultural activities. And we get into the industrial era about two and three centuries ago and start burning coal and other fossil fuels, accelerate the removal of trees in Europe, and we see things begin to take off in this geometric curve. For decades, it sort of just advanced, and now it's, going, it's, it's turning upward, you know, the accelerating. There's some additional evidence that comes in to support this uh, idea that human beings have affected the climate, the composition of the atmosphere by our activities. And among them are uh, evidence of weather in the, the transition from the Middle Ages to the early modern period around 1500 and following. We talked about the Little Dryas as a period when natural events, even cataclysmic ones, changed the climate abruptly. But human beings have had an impact on a significant scale, and we can again. I think that's the conclusion to come to. We know, for example, that we, there was a period of significantly colder temperatures from about the 14th century to the middle of the 19th century and that it got even much colder after 1500. Well, as Mark Cohen was saying yesterday in here, in one of these salons, when he talked about the extensive uh, three-dimensional agriculture of Central America and the Amazon and the people who created dark earths, terra preta in Portuguese, uh, these black, carbon-rich soils that have persisted in the intensely hot leaching conditions of the tropics for hundreds of years after the times they were laid down by human beings. We're not exactly sure, but it involves low temperature burning or pyrolysis in which the volatiles of organic matter are driven off and the solid uh, cell structure turns into pure carbon and that is incorporated into soils. And then it has a coral reef-like effect and harbors microorganisms and nutrient extremely well. So these soils maintain their fertility, uh, evidently, for centuries. We don't even know how long. That's some of the evidence. Some of the, it's not quite anthropological, but historical evidence from the writings of um, a man named Francisco de Orellana, who was a nephew of Pizarro, the conqueror of Peru, was sent you know, by his uncle to reach the Atlantic. So he went from the Andes down the Amazon, 3,000 miles, and records what his findings were. Albert Bates went to the library in Seville and found the original documents and translated them and reports on this in a book called The Biochar Solution, published a few years ago. Some of you may have seen it. Oriana says his party encounters people on the river, and not just people you know, coming from the jungle, but open fields and villages and towns and even city-like settlements. And it got more and more dense the farther down the river he went. And, and initially there was friendly contact, and then they sort of got onto him and realized the Spaniards weren't all that uh, desirable. <laughs> they were intruders. And they kept getting attacked, you know, so there's this, he fights his way basically to the Atlantic Ocean through millions of people who, were, who had this very sophisticated agricultural civilization. A huge area, bigger than France, three times, you know, more like the whole of Western Europe. But the area where the terra preta soils occurred was as big as France, all along the rivers. It's possible in flying over the Amazon to still see some of the the lanes and, that were opened up that had been cultivated in areas, although they're largely obscured at the ground level. So there was an enormous amount of cleared land that had been taken out of jungle and put into cropland. And the same thing largely occurred in the Mississippi River Valley in, the, in North America. These areas 
changed rapidly after the Spaniards arrived and brought with them their microbiomes, which were uh, filled with organisms and pathogens that the Native American peoples had no resistance to. Measles, smallpox, typhus, on and on. Within uh, a few decades after the arrival of Ponce de Leon and the other early overland explorers in uh, Pizarro and the others in South America and North America, the native populations collapsed. And while there might have been uh, 100 million people living in the Americas uh, before Columbus arrived, the population fell by tenfold in, in, uh, within a century. And what happened was those farm fields in the Amazon and in the Mississippi Valley were abandoned and they regrew. So we have a myth in this country of the trackless wilderness from Maine to Georgia and a squirrel leaping from crown to crown of the trees and never having to touch the ground all the way. But what we saw when our ancestors arrived was a garden abandoned, a landscape that had been cultivated intensively, allowed to go back to trees because no one was there to keep it. But to, to burn out the brush, to maintain it in, in a condition that had been favorable to people living in it at the time. Oh, it's, I'm sure they were fundamental to that, uh, to the kind of agriculture that was practiced, which was more uh, familiar to us with disturbance of the soil and planting of annuals and those kinds of things. Uh, terra preta is helpful and uh, less, uh, less essential in a three-dimensional uh, woody agriculture, which is what's adapted now uh, in Central America and parts of the Amazon and other, other places. But for field agriculture and continuous disturbance, then a, a stable form of carbon is essential. What we now know from modern practice in the Amazon is when people clear the forest to ranch or grow soybeans or whatever it is they do in Brazil, largely, the, the soil just burns up. There's very little organic matter, and this is true everywhere in the tropics. Because of the heat and the lack of a dormant season, there's really no need and there's also no opportunity for carbon to accumulate in soils. It stays in the biomass. It's taken up and stands as the trees and then the vines and the small plants and the animals. That's where the fertility is in tropical systems. Where we have long winters, as here in Massachusetts or in Michigan or anywhere in most of North America, the fertility has to be stored in the soil because the plants go dormant for long months at a time. Right? They maintain their woody structure, particularly the trees, but the fertility is in the soil. So there's more carbon in temperate soils and very little in tropical soils. That's why the terra preta soils are an anomaly. They don't make sense, and we know now that they were created. We think by burning midden heaps, by charcoal making, we're not sure exactly what their formulas were, how they did it, but they've persisted. And they're very deep soils. They're four, five, six feet. You can cut into banks in, in the area around Manaus above the river and see deep, dark, black soils that look just like Illinois or Indiana prairie till. It pulled carbon out of the atmosphere on such a vast scale that it dropped the average temperature for several hundred years. So we, we entered a period that's called the Little Ice Age. It's true, and what, but what I'm, in, um, in the Amazon, the forest regrew. Uh, there, the, the terra preta soils were not disturbed, but they were only a very modest part, maybe a quarter of this extensive area that had been opened up. You've got it. Thank you. If, I, if, if that's a clearer or simpler way. Yes, yes. The point is here that in, even in, in uh, historical uh, epoch, we have influenced the climate, we humanity, and even only on a part of the planet, just in the Americas, just in two large river valleys, admittedly huge ones. What was the river in the North American? The Mississippi, the big, the big father of waters. Yes, yes, it just shot right up. It came right back. Plenty of moisture, plenty of heat, nothing to interrupt it. The trees grew back and pretty, you know. It did, exactly. It, it put Europe in the deep freeze. 
You can see the paintings of Peter Bruegel uh, showing peasants in Europe in the winter, you know, pollarding trees and crows flying overhead and deep snow everywhere. You know, he's recording those conditions, and they persisted till about 1850. Peter Bruegel, I think it's Peter Bruegel the Elder, all right. That's good news, surprisingly, because it means we could do it now. Yeah, I'll accept that there are different opinions here. I don't know that, you know, I find it, uh, I find Rudman basically uh, convincing, and this other evidence I'm offering here it looks to me like it supports it. It's like the, um, the up and down might have been related to other factors. There might have been some natural variation at the outset, and then it seems that the activity of the interaction between Europeans and Americans uh, push things further into a cold period. All right, so carbon moves up and down, and we're involved in that moving up and down. And um, we use plants to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. So in the long term, we've got too much carbon in the atmosphere. We need to get plants growing, and we need to expand photosynthesis around the planet. Uh, but to do that, we have to address the disturbed condition of our land, and that's where we get into some uh, little more colorful uh, imagery. I drew these as posters, and then I photographed them so I could carry them around. But um, if I can, maybe I... Thank you. Um, aha, I have a pointer. So I'll step a little bit away here. There's some things, uh, this is, this is uh, Charles Keeling's laboratory graph from Mauna Loa. And what it shows in that sawtooth rising curve is the progression from when he starts in 1958 to when I drew the, the graph <coughs> a couple of years ago. And the big red seven parts per million up is every November because the land area of the planet is not evenly distributed between northern and southern hemispheres. More of the land is in the north. More of the, uh, the southern hemisphere is mostly ocean with small land areas. And uh, although the oceans and the land do about as much photosynthesis and absorb about as much carbon every year, the oceans are three times extensive, uh, as extensive as the land. The land area of the planet is only about a quarter of the surface. So the land, and particularly the northern hemisphere, land masses are the real powerhouse in greenhouse gas absorption, in carbon absorption uptake, because there's more plants, you know, New England and all around the northern hemisphere. Every May, those plants wake up and start photosynthesizing, and they start pulling it back down out of the atmosphere, and five parts per million is reabsorbed. So we have this sawtooth movement up and down, but always a little more up, and a little more up, and a little more up. And now, rather than two parts per million, it's two and a half. So it's moving at a faster rate. Okay. But notice, you know, what's implied in that is not just the mm, mounting minor key music uh, danger, but there is absorption of carbon dioxide on a large scale every year. What we really need is simply to expand that, right? If we're doing five parts, we could get to seven, eight, nine. We could pull it back down. So that says something about how much vegetation we need, but much but more. And it isn't the whole picture. It's really just, it's a gauge. It's a gauge. Yeah. Part of the challenge is as we start to pull carbon out, and assuming we figure out how to do carbon farming really well, and we reforest and all of that kind of thing, there's a huge store of it in the acidified oceans that needs to be released, and it will re-equilibrate to the atmosphere for a while. We might actually cool the planet long before we pull the carbon dioxide levels down, at least on a human scale. By decades or generations, we don't know. It's hard to tell. But the dangers come from overheating of the land surface. And for that, we need to focus on water. It all works together. So I don't want to get, create a false dichotomy here. Like the carbon uh, is absorbed during photosynthesis, which 
always involves transpiration. But just as we shouldn't obsess about the CO2 as the only measure and the, the real driver, it's not. You know, we, we don't want to uh, separate them. We want to understand that transpiration, photosynthesis, is the main story, and along with that comes carbon ab absorption. And respiration is carbon release. We respire, plants respire at night, and so on. All right, so here's the, the story. If, if humans had not done agriculture, we'd be at 240 or a little less now, somewhere in there. We were at 280 in 1850, and we're over 400 today. So the amount of heating attributable to carbon dioxide is shown by this curve. The amount of heating that we have is up here, and the rest of it is mainly water vapor. So the conceit of the scientists, you know, I have sympathy, but it did get us on the wrong track, was that water was a, a derivative process. As the atmosphere heated up, there'd be more moisture in it. There's more rain now. We are seeing that with huge events, right? Because there's more moisture in the atmosphere, because it's warmer, it can hold more water vapor. And that they didn't, therefore, have to model it separately because it would rise in keeping with the increase in temperature. And that could be measured by CO2. That's an inadequate model, and that's what I'm trying to point out. And I learned this from a man named Walter Yenne, who is an Australian microbiologist now in his 70s. He's a brilliant man and a very you know, gentle soul, and he has, he and not he alone, but many other people around the world are working to move the, the water paradigm forward. So we understand that urgent action is not only needed, but possible to cool the land surface and therefore the atmosphere to reduce the risks from fire, flood, drought, and storm. That's the danger. That'll knock us out. That'll destroy our agriculture and our infrastructure. And as Michal Kravchek, uh, so the Slovakian hydrologist and his institute, uh, have demonstrated and begun to show sea level rise is partly attributable to the draining of water off the continents. It's not only because we're melting the glaciers. That is a fact. But we're also literally draining from land surfaces too much water. Deterioration of, Deterioration of soil, loss of carbon sponge capacity, loss of you know, carbon. Every 1% every organic matter in soil holds 20,000 gallons on an acre. Vast amounts of water have been lost in that way. Uh, all the runoff that's increased from urbanization, roads, farm fields that have uh, no plant cover much of the year, loss of forests cover. We've probably lost 50% of the forest cover since the post-glacial maximum. Study in 2015 indicated uh, there are maybe 3 trillion trees on Earth, and that's down from a, about 6 trillion. So. Forests are much better at holding water back than farm fields or grasslands. Twice as effective. About 10% of water will run off of a forested landscape. 20% will run off of a, a, a prairie landscape. And farm fields without vegetation are pretty seriously um, you know, shedding water. Then here we have a picture of the, con the circumstance, the big picture circumstance. There's uh, about 130 uh, gigatons or billion tons of carbon that move up to the um, atmosphere at, in any given year. And about 60 billion tons are absorbed by the oceans and 60 billion more by the land vegetation, leaving 10 billion to accumulate in the atmosphere. So we've been ratcheting up. Uh, carbon, that's, that's this, those spikes that keep rising. That's that 10, accumulating 10 billion tons. What we need to do uh, on the carbon front is to neutralize that and pull down more. So we need about 20 billion tons additional photosynthetic capture. That's our goal. If we could do that, we would, we would begin to reverse the accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere. That's, but that's, it's not like we've just got to focus on getting the carbon out. We need to do it, 
but we need to do it in a way that also cools the land surface. Thankfully, they run together. We don't, we're not in conflict there. Can we do it? Well, there's almost 14 billion hectares of land on the planet. If we need 20 billion tons, that's a ton and a half of carbon per hectare per year, which is only six tenths of a ton or about 1,200 pounds of carbon on an acre. Not very much, actually. Um, I taught with Joel Salatin, the famous uh, rotational grazer from Virginia a few years ago. And as an aside after the event, he said, you know, I don't believe anything in, about soil tests much, but my dad had one done when we bought the farm in the Shenandoah Valley in 1961, and there was a, about 1.5% organic matter in the soil at that point. It was beat up, burnt out. We, that's why he got it cheap. And uh, this was 46 years later, and he said, I just had one done this year at the urging of a friend, and it turned out we've got 8% now. He's done no tillage. He's rotated cattle and chickens, and now he's adding other animals in over the, that pasture land consistently for half a century, accumulating, I did the math, two tons carbon per year per acre. That's three times what we need here. He's doing it in Virginia, and that's not even the most productive or you know, potentially photosynthetic region on the planet. It's just one that we have access to. He didn't plan it. He just did what he thought was smart farming. And now he became, he became famous for it because people saw that he was successful. I've been on his farm, you know, in July, and the neighbor's land is up to the fence is all brown and his is green, and, you know, they've been in drought for a month or two months. You know, he's got carbon in the soil holding water. It's growing grass. It's feeding cattle. He's learned how to do direct marketing, and, and he's, you know, he's turning over a million and a half a year or something on a small farm. People are coming to him and say, manage my acres, please. Manage my acres. He's training people and who are, I've met at this conference. Our friend Miranda, who was at lunch the other day, Susan, worked with him. So anyway, where do we do it? Oops. Oh, God, please, back. Where do we do it? Well, uh, there's, there's the Virginia example, prairie grazing five tons per hectare. Um, this is the biomass figure. This is the carbon figure. Because biomass is made up of oxygen and hydrogen and nitrogen, you know, atoms that are also mixed in with the carbon. Peat, peat moss, or peat accumulating in Ireland over 5,000 years on top of stone walls that were once in the open ground shows we can build up four tons per year per hectare. Prairie grazing is more effective in cold climates where the carbon doesn't burn off. So in Saskatchewan, we get better results than in Virginia, which is a warmer climate, so there's more oxidation. Darwin's descri description of vegetable mold and composting and gardening says, you know, turns into 11 tons per hectare per year, his figures. Uh, Willie Smith's uh, planting of of uh, rainforest in Borneo has generated 12 to 15 tons per hectare per year. Sugarcane fields, a perennial crop, actually, in the tropics of Queensland. Yes? Queensland, QLD, Queensland, Australia. Uh, Sugarcane like corn and sorghum and uh, bamboo are C4 photosynthesizers. They're like on steroids. They really pump carbon in. They ha Who? Hemp may. I, I, I haven't had anyone tell me that definitively, but it acts that way. It certainly grows huge amounts of biomass. Anyway, the numbers are clear. Even in the poorest uh, condition with no trees and, and uh, cool, uh, damp climate and short growing seasons, we can do it. And in the tropics, you know, in aquatic environments, water hyacinth will produce this much, 300 tons per hectare per year. Yeah, we can do it. Two and a half acres. Sorry, you know, these are just, this is science talks in hectares. But, uh, you know, I, I understand. I, I try to translate. So we can uptake that carbon. That's good. Now, what else do we need to know? Uh, how heat gets into the sky. This is the other part of the physics. Sunlight hits the top of the atmosphere, 342 watts per square meter. About half reaches the Earth. 
Thing is, 342 is coming in, and 339 is getting back out. What that means is we're building up heat trapped in by the, the greenhouse gases, but less than 1%. We've thrown the heat balance off by less than 1%. It's, it's making a big difference. We can feel it and see it and experience it with the storms and the heat waves and the fires all on our TV screens, you know, in the news. We, we know it, and it's like we, it's making our skin crawl a bit, and it should. But it's still only a minor perturbation, actually, in the big system. The trouble is the climate is delicately balanced, and this is why it's been able to flip from deep ice ages to warm periods fairly quickly and consistently. So the, the challenge here is to address the thermodynamics of the atmosphere and cool it. And for that, water is our friend. About half of this sunlight coming in reaches the Earth's surface. It strikes the Earth. The light turns into heat. It changes frequency, and it re-radiates, but it can't pass back out through the sky and the atmosphere because the not as easily because the gases trap those long wave, uh, long waves. Surface radi radiation is affected by color, which is called albedo, the whiteness of the surface. Snow is a perfect reflector, or virtually. Clouds, high albedo clouds, you know, you see them, the big puffy cumulus, they reflect really well. Uh, brown soil in farm fields absorbs most of the light and turns it into heat and re-radiates it. Uh, this, there's some, I think, distracting discussion about whether uh, melting of ice in the, in the boreal regions will result in more, or, you know, more exposure of dark pine surfaces, and should we cut down the boreal forest because it's going to absorb too much, too much um, uh, light and heat and so forth. And I think that's kind of crazy, but we'll get to that. Yeah, we could just pave it all, right? Green plants transform the light energy into sugar, and that's trans photosynthesis. And along with that goes transpiration. So as plants absorb car carbon, they also release moisture. And particularly trees not only release moisture, they release it high up. And furthermore, they uh, have associates in the stomata underneath their leaves. Underside of leaves is all little tiny pockets called stomata, and that's where um, photosynthesis and sugars are being created from the light collecting on the upper surface. And in those stomata, there are bacteria. We just call them aerobacter because they fly through the air. that get released regularly, high up. Trees influence the atmosphere about 20 times their height. So a tall redwood or a sequoia is reaching up to the bottom of the stratosphere. And if you think those trees are only in California, the tall trees in the east used to be 200 and 250 feet, the poplars and all of those, some of the chestnuts and so on. We don't see them anymore. They were all cut down. They were too tempting to steal. But we can influence all the way up to the stratosphere by planting trees, and we can release these you know, they release bacteria. We don't do anything. We just have to let it happen, encourage it to happen. The trees are releasing huge volumes and other vegetation too, huge volumes of moisture, and that is nucleating into raindrops and snowflakes around these bacteria. Now, that's not the only way rain and snow form in the atmosphere. Over the oceans, it is uh, salt crystals. And over the polar regions where it's icy, it's ice crystals. Those work equally well. But over the vegetated parts of the land in particular, it's bacteria from plants, and particularly from trees. So water vapor forms clouds. It reflects more light uh, before it reaches the ground to become heat. And here's the rub. Heat, because of the physics, what we know now is that the heat transfer by radiation varies as the fourth power of the temperature difference, meaning when temperature goes up a little, heat radiation goes up enormously, which is why your stove, when you light it and it's struggling along at 200 degrees, is not putting out any heat. But when it gets to 400 degrees in the chimney, now you start to feel warm and the room warms up. Huge amount more heat is coming out, not just twice as much, but more than twice as much. 
if we have a cornfield in July that's bare, they've taken the crop off, the soil may reach 140 degrees Fahrenheit. But if that's covered in vegetation, the soil will stay at 68 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade. Not only is that better because the bacteria and the microbes are then active and able to assist the plant, but all that heat isn't going back to the atmosphere. All right. It never even reaches the soil. Yeah. There's, uh, there's more heat and there's more moisture in the atmosphere because it's warmer, but it's not, it's not falling. What we've done is interrupt what's called the small water cycle, which is where it comes up off the vegetation and then comes back down as rain locally. And we're getting huge amounts of moisture accumulate and then bigger planetary large water cycles are kicking in and we get rivers of moisture that move uh, with a jet stream and bring these enormous dumps. And we get moisture available for hurricanes and huge storm events are occurring. It's because it's not being regularly dropped back out because we've broken the connection between the earth and sky by removing the vegetation in too many places, the balance is out. It was, a, it was a kind of process by which water moved up and down, water moved up and down, and it didn't move so far. Um, so this is a NASA illustration that I find is more symbolic than anything else. The numbers are there, but if you try to add up and do the math, it, it'll you know, make your eyes cross. So don't do that. Just look at it and realize some of the heat is coming and bouncing back up, and a lot of it is reaching the surface, half of it roughly, and then is working its way back up to be trapped by clouds and warming up and holding. It's warming the surface. It's warming the oceans. We've been spared some of the worst effects of warming over the last century because the oceans are taking it up and taking it up and taking it up. They've, it's interesting that they only have a massive transpiration coming out of the ocean. Yes, isn't that bizarre? Because really it's coming off the land more, and this is where they put latent heat, and that's what the plants are doing. It's latent heat that we need to increase. On the land surface, because that might industry. Yeah, well, we're going to have to do it. You know, industry is going to have to come in line. It's not that you know, we have to stop eating. It's not that we have to stop growing food. It's that we have to do it in a different way, and we have to stop these careless practices of leaving land fallow and empty and, and exposed to the sun. And, Yes, and we're paving it over, and the pavement is dangerous. And our, you know, all of our buildings and cities should have green roofs where we can, and parking lots should be uh, vegetated with trees so that they don't heat up in the summer. And roads need overhanging trees. You know, let's solar panels over them. Solar, solar panels over them. Yes. Okay. So where are we? Am I going in the right direction? Did I get there? I'm going that way. All right. So. Here are the six, seven processes that are important to us to pay attention to uh, in this rehydration and uh, restoring the small water cycles so that we can cool the planet. Um, yeah. The first is to cover the soil and shade pavements. So here's my example, a corn crop at 68, soil is 68 degrees here, remove the vegetation in July, and, it, and the temperature shoots up to 140 degrees because the thermal differential is based on degrees Kelvin, which is like absolute zero, not the, the measure of you know, Fahrenheit temperatures. It means that that act increased radiant heat 60%. And farmers do that all the time on mil hundreds of millions of acres. Right? They just clear cultivate and remove during parts of the growing season. We need to stop tillage as much as possible. It's very dangerous. Not only does it destroy soil structure and thus the ability to hold moisture and minerals and burn up carbon, but it overheats the land surface. So it's contributing to all of our problems. And chemicals do much the same in terms of the way they treat the soil structure. Um, here is the second process, transpiration by green plants. Every gram of water that's transpired moves 596 calories of latent heat up. That's a big leverage. Now, my drawing's a little confused because of the two and the four, and I had to squeeze some things in here. We'll jump back across to the left, 
and look at this. All kinds of things create hazes in the atmosphere. Algae and dimethyl sulfide molecules, terpenes from trees. This is the basis of Ronald Reagan's claim that trees cause pollution. They do release things that cause hazes, uh, smogs. He was a Californian. He understood about smogs. He wanted to blame something other than cars. Clay dust and wind, er wind erosion from human traffic. You know, just the seven some billion humans shuffling around, all of us on surfaces are sending dust up in the atmosphere. Tiny, tiny particles, too tiny to nucleate moisture. These hazes, brown hazes, cover vast areas, continental scale areas off the coast of Southeast Asia and off the coast of the United States. And they're, they're you know, just the unseen effects in the atmosphere of our movement and our stirring things up and black carbon from diesel engines and uh, cooking fires that are you know, settling out sometimes in the Arctic. There's a huge amount of this stuff. We need to reduce them. What they, they don't reflect any light back, so they'll let it go in, but they do tra help trap heat, which is regrettable. The normal healthy process of the atmosphere would be to, uh, these things would be attracted to nuclei uh, of rain and snow at a million particles to one. Raindrop nuclei are very tiny, and so are snowflake nuclei, but they still pull in things a million times over from these small, very, very fine particles. These are the dangerous elements of pollutants that are like in ash that are very fine and get in the lungs and cause uh, disease and, and ultimately sometimes cancer. So if we uh, inspire or uh, move transpiration uh, by plants to increase the amount of uh, rain and snow, raindrop and snowflake uh, nuclei, uh, chiefly from bacteria released by trees, which have the right glycol structures to attract moisture, they will grab hold of this stuff and pull it out of the sky, which reduces trapped heat, cleans the air, and you know, changes more of the dynamics. That's another process. Three, reduce the hazes. The nucleation of rain and snow in and of itself is a cooling process. And it forms high albedo clouds, which reflect more light and can therefore prevent heating of the Earth's surface. We have, we have a, um, a proof example of this that occurred accidentally through the European expansion and discovery of the, of the early modern age. When the Portuguese went to the island of Madeira, which is in the central Atlantic, they harvested trees and floated them down the rivers. They were valuable mahogany-like trees. And there are no more rivers on Madeira. They removed all the trees, like the Eastern Islanders, and they dried up the island. It was the trees, because of its location, its latitude, without trees, the island doesn't get regular rain of any kind. So there's no more rivers and there's no more forests. This, the British did the same in the South Atlantic on Ascension Island, and it stopped raining, and then they realized, oops, and they went and planted, and they restored the forest, and in fact, now it's, it's, they have regular climate. <laughs> yes. Yes. They were going and moving plants from everywhere, so they've created a sort of, you know, postmodern uh, exper experiment station. But they brought the rain back by planting trees. We can too. Are you with me? Yeah. All right. So what we are seeing is, we need more evapotranspiration to release latent heat. We need to clear hazes and increase rain and snowfall and the cover of the earth by high albedo clouds. There's two other processes. One of these that we're seeing as global warming kicks in and climate change is the closing of radiation windows at night. So we're getting higher nighttime temperatures. Who hasn't experienced this or who has experienced it, right? Uh, I think I decided to move to Michigan about 
eight years ago when I was living in southern Indiana. I didn't consciously decide that then, but I was out at midnight and it was 90 degrees and I was watering the garden because it was the coolest time of the day. And I said, I can't live here. This is intolerable. The plants won't be able to survive. At 90 degrees, almost none of our food plants can grow or photosynthesize. And we're, gonna, we're experiencing those many more days like that during the year. This is a quite a serious issue and not really adequately looked at. It's getting too hot to grow to perform agriculture, as we have done it. So we're needing more tree cover now, immediately, just as people have always needed in the tropics. We have radiation windows at night. Uh, this, this, this see this most in um, places that have monsoon conditions or climates. Uh, it'll rain during the day and clear the air, and then it'll be cool at night, and, and uh, heat will re-radiate particularly off our urban areas. This is important because they're heat islands. And these are closing because we're not getting those little rains and little clearings that open up the sky at night. It stays hazy and cloudy and, and the heat gets trapped in. So it's not leaving during the night when it could cool. The night sky is very cold. You know, and, and radiation ensures that if the surface of the Earth is warm and the sky is at absolute zero, then a huge amount of heat will go up through, as long as the atmosphere doesn't trap it unduly, but we're creating traps, holding in. So we need to reopen those radiation windows. That's not something we can just do by opening the blinds, but we can do it by these processes here. And the last piece of this is a bit of science that comes from the work of a couple of Russians published in 2007, Makarieva, a woman, and Gorshkov, a man. Uh, when they studied uh, transpiration at coastal regions, they realized as trees transpire, they create low pressure around them. That part of that transformation that comes from uh, moisture being released, they create areas of low pressure around them and that pulls in the air all around. So when those are on coasts, it pulls in warm air or moist air from the, from the uh, surface of the, the ocean or large bodies of water. It's basically a low-level vacuum that pulls in. And of course, we know from here that the trees are not only releasing heat, but they're nucleating moisture. So they're pulling in moisture, sending it up, transpiring it, and then they're causing rain. And that comes back down, and they pull it, and they cycle it. And it moves. So as long as the trees at the coast are connected to the trees of the interior of the continents, moisture will move readily from the ocean all the way to the interior. And in the Amazon, which would not normally be of a jungle, but might, because of its latitude, be a desert. We have this process going on, and there are seven cycles, approximately, of transpiration and re-rain and transformation and re-rain from the Atlantic to the Andes. The same thing goes on in North America. We pick up moisture from the Gulf, and we move it into Kansas and Oklahoma and Nebraska, which would not normally get enough moisture. So the biotic pump, uh, hypothesis here suggests that we need continuous bands of trees, tree cover, from the coasts to the interior of the continents. The other place that it's really important for us to plant trees is on ridges and in riparian zones for two different reasons. On ridges, we get and intercept the airflow and we start creating what scientists call orographic rain. Orographic, mountain-written rain. Um, because the trees up on the top ridges not only begin controlling the runoff better, but they most effectively interact with the atmosphere. And the trees along riparian or riverine zones protect the banks and harbor and cool the water for habitat and filter runoff. So those are high priority areas, coastal, ridge, and riparian forests. That would describe a network to the, connecting to the interior, and that would also describe a system of wildlife corridors for migration of species that would help to heal the broad landscape, even as we continued to use zones in between them for agriculture in more conventional ways. Even that needs to transition to agroforestry. So, where we're growing trees literally in the crop fields, either in alleys or on edges. Or pollarded. They can or pollarded, they can be in a scatter pattern. 
uh, broad, broadleaf trees uh, transpire more during the growing season. So, but, you know, the ones that will survive, the natives and the adapted exotics are the ones you want to choose. And I'm advocating always that we choose trees that we can manage economically so that people don't feel they're, being, they're giving something up, but they're actually getting something back, where we can harvest uh, hay, as it were, tree hay or fodder from trees, or animals can forage on them, or they fix nitrogen like the black locust, which is one of our great trees here, or they give nuts, or they give fruits and pods that can be eaten, uh, and so on and so forth, all of those things. So here's our story of agriculture. Uh, it's the ABCD. Agriculture works with above ground biomass, but we often forget that 10% or 10 times as much is below the ground, particularly in temperate regions. What we do, and we have a choice, mostly right now we burn it off with tillage, chemical fertilizer, biocides, and we leave it bare with fallow, none of which are any good. We need to end those practices. What instead we should be doing is sinking the carbon by decomposition through microbes and animals into the soil, where in the soil, through vectors of compost, manure, the roots of plants, it is uh, taken up, manipulated, regulated, and stored by fungi. A little known kingdom, Peter McCoy uh, gave a really wonderful talk on fungi yesterday, um, and I encourage you. You know that all these, these talks are being recorded, so if you missed one, you can go back and see them when they eventually get put up on YouTube. But here's um, fungi are making humates. They produce their cell bodies are made of chitin, which is the same protein that characterizes the exoskeletons of insects and it's indigestible by the human alimentary tract. So if you eat mushrooms, cook them or pickle them. So the chitin breaks down and you can absorb this, the nutrient. But chitin becomes glucosamine through some enzymatic processes and then glomalin or glomalin, which is a gluey substance that sticks together soil particles into aggregates. We all know what worms do. They make castings, black gold, lovely little crumbs, of extremely fertile stuff. Well, fungi do the same thing with soil. They stick together little unconnected pieces of mineral material into aggregates with glue. And earthworms do, you know, you pass it through their digestive tracts and then things called oligopolysaccharides glue together those particles and they come out the back end of worms and other uh, fauna in the soil. That's a part of the process of carbon banking Fungi spread their roots or hyphae through the soil. There can be as many as 25 kilometers of those hyphae in a, in a cubic meter of soil, vast amounts. But our tillage agriculture and our chemical agriculture disrupt it. Lest they disrupt the bacteria, the fungi they tear up, they shred, and they destroy. So that has to change. We need more resilient conditions in soil so that we can extend the longevity and the extent of green growth. This is the water key. We need to store water and, and soil, and to do that we need carbon and the root structures of fungi and plants all the time. We need stable soils that are not being broken up. Plants feed microbes at their roots with exudates of sugar that they produce from photosynthesis. They're great altruists, but it's a kind of selfish altruism. They give away a lot of food. And they do it to culture the microbes that are around them, which then help them mobilize water and mineral nutrient. And incidentally, fungi also move information. They move it from one tree to the next tree. They move it from plants on the edge of the forest to the interior of the forest. When a pest comes along and attacks the leading edge, of a plant community that those plants begin producing particular chemicals to combat the pest, whether it's an insect or a pathogen. That information is then conveyed by fungal hyphae through the wood wide web to other trees in the interior that then produce the chemical even before the insects or the pathogen arrive. So that's an adaptive 
function that the fungi help the plants to perform. So we get carbon in soil, we get dividends from it. Every gram of carbon holds eight grams of water. Every pound of carbon holds a gallon. Every 1% of carbon increase in or agricultural soils leads to an uh, uh, increase in the ability to hold water of 20,000 gallons or more. We're still trying to measure it. And the more, 1% per acre, 1 1 per acre 20,000. I've heard a figure of 28,000. I've read various numbers. 20,000 is a good round number. The fungi are also doing really important uh, roles. Uh, they're fixing uh, nutrients. They're solubilizing nutrients. They're making available nutrients that the plants could not reach by the extent of their hyphae. They make the plant community more resilient. Uh, they bind up particles using glomalin to make soil aggregates in the interior of which they use these glomalins, kind of a fatty lipid material, and they make membranes around soil aggregates that then get a reduced atmosphere inside. There's less oxygen inside those soil aggregates, which means the carbon is more stable. It's less likely to go to carbon dioxide. And as it turns out, in reduced oxygen conditions, the plants are better able to uptake minerals. When Organic matter is being digested by aerobic bacteria because we're, we're churning and tilling the soil. It's oxidized. It's saturated with oxygen. And that means that the iron, which has a two-valence variation, is in its red, rusty form. It's hard. It's intolerable. And it hangs on tightly to mineral nutrients and won't let them go. Oops. But when we allow the soil to be undisturbed, and the bacteria that are breaking down organic matter use up their oxygen available locally very quickly, they go to sleep. And all of the plant pathogens that are um, most dangerous to our crops are aerobic microbes, bacteria. And they're the most sensitive to the lack of oxygen. They're the ones, the easy drunks, they fall asleep first at the party. And then the rest of the aerobes go to sleep. And the anaerobes wake up and start producing ethylene gas, which knocks everybody else out even more, and which also transforms the valence of iron from red to black. I just like to use the colors because it's easier than remembering the, new, the numbers. But you know, it's from 2 to 3 or 3 to 2, and you can go figure it out with your chemistry text. But we go from hard, rusty iron to soft, uh, ferrous iron, you know, black iron. And that then gets very frisky. It gives up all of its bound mineral ion partners, throws them off. It goes over and grabs hold of clay and organic matter and forces off the rest of the anions that are attached there, like phosphorus, trace elements, and sulfur. And all of a sudden, all the mineral ions are looking at each other, and they're in solution, and they're at the party, and there's nobody to dance with, and the plants just zap them and grab them up. So we need reduced microsites in the soil. We need places where the soil undisturbed, stable, oxygen levels can be lower temporarily. Oxygen always rediffuses into the soil, so there's, it's never going to run out except momentarily. And most of this goes on in the root zone, the rhizosphere. So that plants, the, root, root, right, the rhizosphere rocks back and forth between aerobic and anaerobic conditions, and plants, organic matter breaks down, and then plants absorb the mineral nutrient. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. That's a healthy condition. That oscillation, that polar os oscillation, is what we is characterizes all of nature. Light and dark, male and female, aerobic and anaerobic, that's health. That's balance. We need to restore this balance. So fungi are key to doing that. And they help plants assimilate all these mineral nutrients. They also grab moisture. Oops. Ugh. Uh, when the soil feels dry to us, it's below 60% moisture. But fungi can take, continue to take water out of soil down to 22% moisture when it feels dry as dust to us. So there, there's, there's a, one story here, which is don't disturb the soil and let the fungi do their work. Uh, thanks to Dave Jackie and Eric Tainsmeyer and their illustrator for this picture of a forest garden or 
uh, a pear tree, it looks like, and its companions showing all the different potential uh, components of a food-bearing perennial system. This is not the only kind. Uh, permanent prairies with grazing livestock is another perennial food system because those grasses regrow on their own after grazing or mowing. But we can derive much more food from perennial systems than we presently do and we need to. And perennials build soil. They're doing the whole thing. The tree is doing all of the atmospherics that I've talked about, and it's also working deep layers of the soil. What we don't recognize, what we do recognize with, um, with annual crops and um, pasture grasses and so forth is when we more graze them, there's a release of uh, material, organic matter in the soil. It's what I call a soil climax. You, you grow plants and you cut, kill them off, or you graze or mow them. Sometimes we chop them up and till them in, but that's not as good a practice as simply rolling them down or mowing them down, or better yet, grazing them and fermenting them inside ruminant animals. So they come out. And with trees, it's exactly the same thing. Trees are doing it all on their own. They are very mobile under the ground, and they send out roots to find uh, piles of nutrient, your compost pile. It'll, you build it under a tree, it'll get filled with roots. You know. And the tree will go in there and extract all it can get, and then it'll abandon those roots. And it does that every year and even within the year in cycles. Mine, fine root hairs grow out, grab nutrient, they get used, they're done. OK, we'll throw that away. They're abandoned. They stop being fed. They decompose. They become food. You prune, that's accelerated. If it's a nitrogen-fixing plant and you prune it, the nitrogen colonies, the bacteria in the roots, die back because they're getting less sugar from the tree leaves that are less of those. They, they release the nitrogen. So you can pulse fertilizer into your crop by the way you manage your legumes and your nitrogen-fixing plants. But the same is true of carbon with all vegetation. It's for rotational grazing. It's how rotational grazing works, exactly. And we can, it's how coppice chop and drop systems work. So we want a, a diversity of plants, and we want to manage them to cycle and, and orchestrate soil climaxes. Yes, and, and, and fallow doesn't do it, and leaving the cattle wandering around in a big pasture doesn't do it. Intensive, use all that top material, move on and give it a rest. Chop, drop, and then move along. So it involves more of our attention in the landscape. It's not enough to just grow things. You have to grow and kill them. <laughs> you have to cut them back. You have to like terminate growth. It stimulates more growth. It stimulates more growth. It's not negative. It's just speeding things up. It's spinning the wheel faster so that more carbon goes in the soil, more root growth, more soil development, more water holding capacity, more nutrient availability. Yeah, it's yeah. That's you're turning the biological engine, if you will. You're turning the wheel. You're cranking it. All right. So there's too much of this from all kinds of our activities, forestry, urbanization, bad agriculture, erosion. We've got to stop it. How do we do it? What do we do? So this is where we get at the early stages of this work, which is orchestrating a buildup of moisture holding capacity in the soil. If water is running away and doing all this damage, we're losing the water as well as the soil. And we need to stop that, literally you know, interrupt the flows. So roads on slopes need water bars. Fields that drain need uh, hedges, uh, swales, little berms to intercept not only water but soil particles. We need to think working on contour, plowing on contour, not plowing, cultivating on contour, planting on contour. Uh, no, those are poles that have been driven in. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's, it's, it's woody material from the local area. And so they've, they could, they've, and and they could be, it could be a living fence. We could have been planting uh, willow or something in here and weaving uh, material. But this was take it from the forest, which is healthy, and help heal the agricultural land, which is damaged. 
That's kind of how it's going to work. We're going to find and borrow from healthy ecosystems to restore damaged ones. So we need to get going on it. Uh, we need to collect and hold runoff from roofs and pavement surfaces and open fields everywhere in all kinds of ways. And these are micro earthworks. It's micro engineering. It can be done effectively by small crews working locally. What we need is a subsidy of some money from government, which is already being spent on agriculture badly. We need to redirect agricultural subsidies to these repair works. We did this in the 30s in the United States with the CCC and the WPA. Thank you. They're doing it, they, they're doing it in Slovakia. They got EU grants in 2010 to go in and do a lot of the things I'm going to show you here quickly. Uh, and they, they interrupted flooding that was severe in 2010. By 2011, there, there was much less damage. Uh, we can intercept overland flow in shallow ditches, basins, and berms called swales on contour. Um, and we can get small crews working in upland catchments with stone and wood and wire and simple tools and laying up elegant structures that just slow down the water flow. These are really check dams. They're leaky dams. They're not meant to stop the water forever. They just slow it down long enough that it can sink in. That's the whole point. That's all that water management is about. Slow it down. Don't let it run away. When it wants to run, make it walk. When it wants to walk, make it sit and stand and sink. Uh, in urban areas, rain gardens, uh, permeable pavers, pavements, uh, curb cuts, Brad Lancaster in Tucson, explaining how he waters his garden from street runoff by this modification of structure. Very small intervention, huge payoff. The water's already there. He's just letting it go where it can do some good to the plants. Uh, small uh, check dams in the hills, creating basins, holding water back, gabions, check dams, uh, low barriers, polders, all kinds of names for things we've mostly stopped doing. But they're easily done, and they're easily done on a small artisanal scale. Sometimes digging machinery is helpful. But a lot of this is handwork. Uh, jobs can be created. Many jobs of the kinds that, are, that pay good wages in places that don't have them. And they make permanent improvements to the, to the countryside. Water flows more permanently. We put swales and check dams on a hillside. We can get streams and springs to come back. This is well documented. So that's, that's my pitch to you. We have to move the carbon down out of the atmosphere, and we've got to keep the water on the land longer. And that we need green growth to do that. And the way to start that is to hold the water back. Even before the plants grow, we can do this. this you notice this is not green yet. But when the water is there, it will turn green in the warm season. Well, we've run about out of time, but I'm happy to take comments or discussions. Where will you take this uh, information? How will this affect you? Yes. Well, it, maybe it would claim uh, bullshit on the argument that we shouldn't eat any meat. Now, I have nothing against people making individual choices about diet, but there's a role for ruminant animals in landscape, and there's a valuable role for them in the farm economy. I'll grant you, Americans eat way, way, way too much meat and of a very bad caliber. We're eating 260 pounds of meat a year on average per person in this economy, and Asians eat a quarter of that, which is much more moderate, much more in line with what could be produced from permanent pastures. Some areas need to be in pasture. We're not going to grow a forest across the Dakotas. It's not going to be possible yet. We can grow riparian forests, but we're going to have open ground. And a lot of that, yes. So it's quite, and, and, and they are comfortable in the woods. We had woodland bison as well as plains bison. So while diet's a personal choice, the answer is not in eliminating meat, because that's going to wreck an economy that could re repair landscape. You see. This, the rotational grazing of ruminants is one important strategy in, in certain climate regimes and in many areas. 
to rapidly build up soil carbon and absorptive capacity. It has to be in the toolkit. So for that, we need to respect the farmer who's raising clean meat and selling it to consumers. I agree. I'm completely with you there. That's dangerous and destructive because it's concentrating bad food. Mostly these animals are fed on imported grains, which they don't, ruminants don't digest well. It's leading to uh, too much methane production, sickness, veterinary bills, and we're concentrating that surplus food from large areas in factories, in small regions, and then having to distribute the waste, which is sloppy and liquid and doesn't move very uh, economically anywhere, right around the factory. And so we get a huge splot of, of pollution that runs into waterways and causes other kinds of problems. This is happening in my neighborhood. Three miles from me, there's a CAFO that's growing swine. And yet, even in this, at the end of the Yes, season, the cattle still are. They make it unhealthy before yes, they eat it. Yes, cattle are still more on, on pasture more of the time. But it's changing. You know, dairy cattle are being moved into barns permanently. Almost all poultry and swine in the conventional food system are in factory farms. And this damages the, the economy for the small producer because animals are the profitable section of most farms. You made money with a few pigs and some poultry to top up what you could get from cash cropping of grains and other things. I would, I would modify that a little bit, Jim. I think I'm with you in understanding that it's a terrain issue and not a pathogen issue so much or a pest issue. But uh, this is, I think, most amply demonstrated with the chestnuts, which died off en masse in the 30s. After <clears throat> they became they became ecologically extinct, although they're not gone. After they lost one of their major associates, which was the passenger pigeon, that moved enormous amounts of nutrient onto them uh, forever and ever. Uh, there were three or four billion passenger pigeons. We shot them all, literally. The last one died in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1913. A generation after they were gone in the wild, the last big flocks were seen about 1886, in, 2000, or in 1904, the Cryphonectria pathogen shows up in the Bronx Zoo and spreads all up and down the East Coast and throughout the chestnut forest, and they succumb. They were starved. You're saying polluted, and I would say the soil, which has the ability to handle pollutants and transform them alchemically through the action of the microbes we've talked about, was starved for nutrient. In this case, the trees hadn't what they needed in order to be resistant. Now, there might have still been some losses there was a pathogen. It did come from Asia, et cetera, et cetera. But the lack of immunity was primarily driven by a lack of nutrient. And where we see surviving, thriving chestnut populations, there's some anomaly, like mine tailings runoff with high levels of zinc in Pennsylvania. And chestnuts are uh, blight-free in that area. Hello. Yes, we got a little carried away. So I talked about that. Yeah. My earlier talk covered some of that stuff. So if you didn't see it, you can maybe catch the recording. Please. All right, all right. All right. Any other comments? What, I'll leave you with a question to take out. What can you do to carry the small water cycle, uh, water healing paradigm into your community and spread this word? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But here, one of the, one of the hidden uh, benefits, one of the treasures, I think, in the water paradigm of addressing climate is that we, if we shift away from the focus, intense focus on CO2, yes, we need to lower emissions, yes, we need to absorb carbon and do it by cycling water, we will take some of the heat off the political situation that has divided communities. Rightly or wrongly, you can judge the business people or the, you know, the oil industry or anything you want. It's not like we give them a free reign, but we can, we've failed, essentially, to reduce emissions. And we will not solve the problem by pursuing that chimera. It, as long as there's fossil fuel available, people are going to want to use it. And it will take a great deal more uh, discipline than we have in our political system to make that happen. I'm not saying it can't be done. Europe is moving that way. California is moving that way. It can be done. It's going to take longer. 
okay, what do we do in the interim to lower the temperature and reduce the risk of fire, flood, storm, and drought? We lower the land surface temperature by increasing green growth and storing water. And that gives us an opportunity to take uh, buyout money, whether through taxes or other means, and p put it into the agricultural and forestry and land repair sectors immediately. It's all on the ground. Everybody can be involved. Absolutely. It's the new green, green New Deal, the real deal. Talk about climate in this framework. Talk about it as, yeah, carbon dioxide's a player in the, in the atmosphere, but it's one out of 25 parts, and water's the rest of the story. And water's essential in agriculture. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, the message can be boiled down to a, a paragraph. Okay. Plant more trees everywhere. Keep ground covered. Don't ever use, let it go bare. Shade pavement. Store water back. Hold water back. Detention basins, swales, absorption pits, and green vegetation. And that could be money making for every farmer. And if we can get some subsidy money into it, even better. Equip grants ought to be doing that. We ought to have a whole 21st century CCC. That's the Green New Deal. Well, there's, you're not in a bad situation then. You know, we need to move to a front where there's damaged land. Yours is, is recovering. So you're not in crisis, but the crisis is widespread. So it's a case for adopting other communities and spreading the word and supporting this kind of action at a state and federal level. Yeah. Well, okay, fine. Trump could get behind this, or maybe he won't. He's not smart enough, but the Republicans might, conservatives might, farmers might. So, and, and here's to put it in big number terms, the city of Akron is only one of many across the country that have combined sewer overflow problems. If they reduce street runoff from rain events that runs away too fast, they can save a lot of money and we can avoid a lot of pollution, and the government is spending money on that. So cities can get behind this. Green roofs, retired runoff, they're like detention basins and new developments. They just hold it back for hours and days until you know, it can be absorbed and then used by plants instead of being lost. We get this runoff, then we get desiccation, and we have a flood and drought deadly cycle that we bounce around in. Did somebody else have a hand up here? You. Um, yeah. I mean, seeing is believing. Some demonstration projects. What I showed you, these examples, is from Central Europe, and it's far away from here, but we have photographs and it's well documented on the web. My Me town has some of those right across the street from me. Yes, we need many more. But the report on the projects that were funded by the EU in 2010 and 2011, Mikhail Kravchek, K-R-A-V-I-K, Mikhail, M-I-C-H-A-L, and the Hydrologic Institute that he works with in Slovakia got a few million euros and put six or 8,000 people to work over the course of two summers. And they had a perfect kind of case study that there was intense flooding prior and they had heavy rains after the installations and almost no flooding. They're working in the mountains but what they're doing is trying to hold the water back so that it's available for the lowlands where the agriculture is done or the land is desiccating. So, you know, we don't, we, we're a bit distant in time from what the CCC did, but this, some of the structures they built are still working well. You know, the evidence is there, but people are not seeing it because they're looking out like this instead of down on the ground where it actually has happened. Oh, please do. Yeah. I'm done and okay. I'm happy and everyone here has had a good time. Thank you so much. Thank you.